Quebec at large. His discourse had struck a chord in the stagnant French society of the day, and many began to see in it a call to liberty. In high society this was seen more in personal terms, but others began to detect in it political implications. Rousseau, too, appeared to have found liberty. The gauche unknown scribbler, on the brink of middle age, was transformed into a celebrity, the scourge of civilization. Rousseau reveled in his newfound fame. He was now accepted on his own terms, and no longer attempted to ape the public manners of the time. Indeed, he was even expected to be temperamental. From now on he would reject civilized behavior and simply be himself. As Rousseau later confessed, this course was adopted for more than idealistic reasons. He was temperamentally incapable of being well-mannered, and in fact didn't properly understand what this involved. Madame de Hoirin might have attempted to teach him the words, but he had no idea of the music. As regards other music, this definitely was not the case. Rousseau's enthusiasms may have made him appear boorish on occasion, but he was not unintellectual, and certainly not ignorant. Many were intrigued by his deep knowledge of music. This proved to be more than theoretical. In 1752 he composed an opera called Le Devin du Village, the village soothsayer. This was quickly recognized as a work of some quality, and a performance was arranged at Fontainebleau in the presence of Louis XV and Madame de Pompadour. The king was so delighted that a day or so later he sent for Rousseau with the intention of awarding him a life pension. But this proved too much. Rousseau's naked temperament was vulnerable at the best of times. On hearing of the king's invitation he became overwhelmed with shyness. What would he do in the king's presence? What could he say? Then, as ever, he sought justification for his reactions. He began to suspect that his precious liberty was under threat. He pretended to be ill, and fled to Paris. Diderot was furious, upbraiding him for his irresponsibility. He could have been supported for life, but instead he had risked offending the king, no light matter. Fortunately, the king did not take umbrage, and the matter was forgotten. Rousseau now courted further controversy by writing his Letter on French Music. As in many autocratic regimes where freedom of speech is curtailed, music played a central role in the French arts during this period, attracting widespread attention. The music lovers of Paris were now split into two rival factions. Les philosophes and their friends favoured the new melodic Italian opera buffa, literally comic opera, epitomised by the Neapolitan composer Pergolesi, whose work Rousseau had arranged for publication in Paris. The traditionalists, led by the seventy-year-old French composer Rameau, despised these cheap Italian tunes. They favoured the classical restraint of French music, with its emphasis on harmony. The precision and grandeur of such music was seen as an expression of the superiority of French culture. Rousseau's Letter on French Music was an early manifesto for Romanticism in the arts. It decreed that the creative spirit should give free rein to its expression, untrammeled by the restraints of tradition and formal rules. The new bravura Italian music was infinitely superior to the stick-in-the-mud French style. Rameau and his supporters were outraged at this insult to the glory of France. Rousseau's opinions were deemed seditious, and such was the popular fury that an effigy of Rousseau was hung in public. But Rousseau had his finger on the pulse of the time. Italian music was the style of the future. Ten years later, in Vienna, the twelve-year-old Mozart would produce his first opera, Bastien and Bastienne, basing it on Le Devin du Village and composing the music in the Italian style. In 1753, the Academy of Dijon announced another essay prize. This time the question to be addressed was, What is the origin of equality among men, and is it authorized by natural law? Here, natural law refers to putative universal laws aligned with the laws of nature, which go beyond the customs, laws, and conventions of any particular society. This would coincide with our modern notion of basic human rights, except that in Rousseau's time there was a widespread belief that such rights or laws were an integral part of nature. Remnants of this belief persist in descriptions of human behavior that draw on adjectives such as unnatural, inhuman, evil, and so forth. For the Academy to pose a question regarding the origin of equality among men was highly unusual, considering that this was very much a provincial bourgeois body, which included lawyers, priests, and counsellors. Equality was a provocative topic, given the social climate of the period. 
France was a country under authoritarian rule, whose huge social inequalities were giving rise to the rumblings of an implacable discontent among the downtrodden mass of the population. It was at this time that Madame de Pompadour made her celebrated remark, Après nous le déluge. After us, it will all be swept away. On hearing of the new essay competition, Rousseau declared, If the Academy has the courage to raise the question, I will have the courage to answer it. And he was as good as his word. The result was his first masterpiece, his Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, published in 1754. This, more than any other work, has been seen as the intellectual spark that would one day ignite the French Revolution. In this discourse, Rousseau develops more fully the original idea he had sketched in the first discourse. Natural humanity was originally good. Only with the advent of civilization did humanity become corrupt. Rousseau uses the term man rather than humanity. Although both he and the French language are incorrigibly chauvinist in this aspect, I have assumed that here Rousseau is usually referring to all of humanity rather than a peculiar part of it. The Discourse on Inequality outlines a hypothetical social history of humanity and its fall from natural grace. This time the devil of the peace is seen more as property rather than civilization, culture, and learning. Rousseau points out that humans are the only species that create their own history. This means that we are responsible for our plight, and are thus responsible for getting out of it. When we compare ourselves with other natural creatures, we see that our social corruption has rendered us miserable. We feel unfulfilled, unhappy, and unequal. Yet how has this come about? As Rousseau saw it, the key to this lay in our inequality, of which there are two types. The first is natural inequality, which comes about through differences in our size, our strength, our intelligence, and such. This inequality is physical and unavoidable. We are neither responsible for it, nor can we change it. The second type of inequality arises from society, and does lie within our control. This results from human choice and action. It is both moral and political. Rousseau sketches how this has come about by means of a hypothetical history of humanity. Here Rousseau adopts a scientific method to reconstruct the phases through which our social development has passed. This is not actual history or even actual prehistory, more a primitive early form of psychosociology. In this prototypical attempt, Rousseau dispenses with actual evidence in favor of insight on a deeper level. His method may appear hopelessly speculative and literary compared to the modern scientific approach, which is more used to having theory backed with solid fact. Yet it is worth bearing in mind that our modern social sciences, which derive from such works, are often forced to a similar resort. Economics, sociology, and even psychology all frequently require belief in a typical human being whose existence has no more factual backing than Rousseau's man. Rousseau's conjectural history of the corruption of humanity is intended to reveal the unnaturalness and evil of the second, artificial form of human inequality. According to Rousseau, in their earliest stage, human beings existed in a solitary state. In this they had no moral relations or determinate obligations to one another. Under such circumstances, Humanity may have lived a somewhat lonely existence, but its individual members were happy and free. Their nature was good. It is worth comparing this view with the similarly speculative moral fable proposed by the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes a century earlier. According to Hobbes, in its original state of nature the life of humanity before the advent of society was nasty, brutish, and short. What took place was a war of every man against every man. Instead of natural law, Humanity required a natural right, the right to self-preservation. Such a right could be enacted only if human beings surrendered their individual liberty and power to an overall sovereign power whose rule had to be obeyed by all. According to Hobbes, this alone could create a society that provided humanity with a peaceable, social, comfortable living. Rousseau's Discourse on Inequality directly opposed this view of society. In the state of nature, Individual human beings behaved in a natural way. They were naturally uncorrupted and good. Vice began only when these innocent individuals joined together to form a society. Where Hobbes's fable may be closer to historical fact, Rousseau's has an undeniably psychological force. We lose something of our nature by partaking in society. Even today we can be momentarily aware of a nostalgia for 
living in the wild, for going back to nature. We imagine that by living closer to nature, we are somehow living closer to our true selves. Even those immune from such rural fantasies would probably concur that domestic social life is in some way unnatural. A phantasm of Rousseau's ideas lingers on in every New Age rural commune, in the parkland surrounding the banker's mansion, 